Good evening, and welcome to Real Talk, where every Sunday night we offer insight, education, and resources for in-home caregivers and those affected in their world. These are the children, the parents, the extended family, and everyone who loves them. And our goal is to offer real-life topics and learning through discussing real issues and offering real solutions. And I am very excited tonight to welcome our guest, Monica Bykoff, who is the founder and owner of the Butterfly Swaddle. And since swaddling is dear to my heart, I'm excited to talk to you about it. But welcome, Monica. It's great to have you. Thank you so much, Tanya. I'm excited to be here and share everything I know about swaddling. (laughs) Fantastic. So even before Monica had children of her own, she knew very early on that she had a passion for caring for babies. She became a nurse at only 22 years of age and started to work in the hospital, maternal, and newborn units. Her passion continued to grow, and so did the knowledge that she had to share. Today, with over 25 years caring for and practicing as a baby nurse, and she can legitimately say that because she is a nurse, Mm -hmm. she feels so fortunate to have had the countless opportunities to help so many families, and more importantly, blessed for all the joy that this career has brought her. And tonight, we're going to dig into one aspect of that career, and we're going to talk about all things swaddling. So I'm really excited about that. (coughs) Excuse me. But before we get into that tonight, Monica, share a little bit about yourself or something kind of fun about you that our audience might not know. I just love anything baby. So uh, that includes uh, my passion for working for a kitten rescue. Mm -hmm. Um, Cats at the Studios, actually. It's just an amazing kitten rescue. And I have done bottle baby kittens with my family for 11 years. We get the tiny little babies, and they're just hours old. And then we feed them every three hours, just like a newborn baby would be uh, fed and help them go to the bathroom and all of that great stuff until we find them adoptive homes. So that's you know a little bit more sleep deprivation added to the already sleep-deprived uh, lifestyle, at least. Why not? <laughs> Absolutely. That's fun. Now, as a cat lover myself, of course, I love that. Um, My husband's allergic to cats, so we don't get to have them. Um, But I love cats. And yeah, I I think when we work in this industry long enough and we get used to being sleep deprived, what's a little more, right? (laughs) Definitely sounds sounds like me. (laughs) For sure. So I want to really dig into this topic tonight. Um, And I want to talk a little bit with you about kind of the background on swaddling. I want you to share with us kind of where swaddling came from or how far it dates back. Um, Because a lot of times people think this is a new concept. Sometimes we hear uh, a little controversy around swaddling. So give us a little history about swaddling. I mean, it it dates back to hundreds of years before and If you look up the images, it used to be with tape, basically, wrapped around the baby's bodies. Um, Because even back in the day, they recognized that when a baby was startled, they were unhappy, they cried more. And although it was not done at all appropriately, and they quickly, you know, recognized that. And instead of having uh, modifications made, there was a a stretch and period of time where that type of swaddling was not done. Um, you know, but it's, it's definitely something that everybody's recognized as a way to calm and soothe, um, those little wicker baskets, those handmade baskets, woven baskets where, you know, babies were strapped on to be able to ride on the back of horses. I mean, it's, it's literally been a part of whether it be clothing or within baskets woven or any kind of concept people were definitely, uh, aware of how newborns would be swaddled and how it would calm them and, give uh, people the ability also to manage their lives around having a newborn because it wasn't like they could just sit back. There was a lot of other things that needed to be handled and done. And so keeping them swaddled kept them safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And given I live in the American Southwest, it was actually something that was cultural here for many hundreds of years. Um, The Native Americans used cradle boards, which was the same kind of concept when babies put in and tied in. Yes. Um, So absolutely. And is swaddling something that we see only in Western culture or is it something that's been done all around the world? 
It's definitely done all around the world. I mean, it is admittedly, they say there's less people in Germany, for example, that do it for, uh, it's just not something that's done over there. But most places you'll find that it's not a new concept at all. If I say the term swaddle, or they would use the term swaddle, they would understand what that is referring to. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think everybody's aware of how many options there are. Usually when people think swaddle, they think a blanket, you know, like at the hospital when the newborns are first, you know, uh, swaddled up and wrapped up like a little burrito. But now for people, (laughs) there's, there's just a lot of options out there for how to swaddle your baby. Yeah, absolutely. And that is part of what we're going to talk a little bit about tonight is options. Um, And so swaddling helps calm babies. Um, One of the things that we hear about a lot, um, and I want to know if there's anything that you could share around this, is something called the fourth trimester. Um, And when babies are first born, how does that impact them? And why is there a need for swaddling during that time? It's a little, uh, it's, it's kind of a joke that's made that human beings are born just way before they were meant to be born. And it's because they have to be able to get out, you know, the passage, <laughs> the natural passageway. And so their brain and their nervous system, all of that still needs to develop. Um, and so we call that developmental stage the fourth trimester, which is the first 12 weeks or so after birth. Um, it can it can last a little bit longer for some babies, but interestingly enough, it's not just the baby who goes through that fourth trimester. It's actually the mom as well um, because of all the emotional and physical demands and becoming, you know, whether it's becoming a mother for the first time or becoming a mother, you know, the third time and managing all of the things that go with it, the emotional and physical recovery and new demands of life. Yeah, absolutely. And there certainly are a lot of them, which is why many of us are employed as newborn care specialists and work for families, right? Yes. Um, So let's talk for a minute about what swaddling does. How does it help babies feel calmer? As we can imagine, um, a baby has been inside a cuddled, warm, dark, not quiet (laughs) place, a, a womb that limited just in the essence of growth and as the baby got older and as the baby went through the 30 plus weeks which is really when that moro reflex of startling begins um the the womb's walls Mm -hmm. helped to keep the baby's arms from flailing scaring themselves and you know we evict them early and here they are with their arms free they can't control it it makes them feel even more unsettled in a world filled with action and new noises, new sounds. And, you know, right from the get go, they're washed and, you know, put into these yucky diapers and like their whole world is just turned upside down. Um, so it's, it's just one way to comfort a baby. Swaddling is just one way because they just need to be held and comforted. And obviously the best thing in the world is to hold your baby and love on your baby and give that comfort to your baby. But there are times where, as we know, as a mother of, you know, four myself, I know that there are times where there's other things that need to be done and, you know, just go to the bathroom without the baby on you, for example, you know, and I'd like to say that we were all lucky enough to have family and friends that live with us for a certain period of time or are there with us to help us through this period. So you can hand a baby, you know, so the baby's always held and that's always an option to feel that comfort and security of being embraced but the reality is that it's not, it's not really common. And it's nice to know that it's okay to swaddle, give your baby that sense of security and be able to put your baby down and they feel great. They don't feel like scared or deprived of not being held for those periods of time. Um, and, you know, there's just a lot of feelings behind whether or not they should carry their baby, hold their baby all the time. And I just, with, with my, with my clients, I just try to explain to them, if you really think about how much you're already holding and comforting and soothing your baby, you know, between the feeding and burping and just hanging out until the baby falls asleep, you're doing that already 90% of the time. It's just about giving, giving yourself a break or being able to give yourself a break and not feel like your baby is not getting the comfort that they need. And they are content and happy as if you were still holding them when they're swaddled. Yeah, absolutely. And so many important points there around being a new parent that you're right. We just don't do very well in Western culture in particular around supporting families. So 
one of the things that really we talk about a lot of times when we talk about swaddling and we talk about safety and things like that is them being on their back. And one of the things we hear about a lot is the back to sleep campaign. What does that have to do with any of this around swaddling? Uh, so actually, I, as I said, I, I was a very young mom and uh, I had my, my first daughter in uh, 1997. And at that time, it was just a couple years. Uh, and I was still transitioning through the time where they were really strict about it. But in the hospital, at that time, it was side sleep actually, that was being pushed. Um, and, you know, we did a lot of research and study and between side sleeping, and then right before that, it was tummy sleeping. Um, they, they recognized that there was a strong correlation between it SIDS and that those types of sleeping positions. And so with the back to sleep campaign that was led in 1994, they discovered that by putting a baby back on, the, on their back to sleep, always on their back to sleep, um, there was a 50% reduction uh, in SIDS-related uh, cases and accidents. So it, it's, it's just a huge, you know, a huge, uh, as, as we evolve, you know, we learn and we discover new things. And, you know, what, what came with that, again, goes back to the foundation of swaddling, because as much as it's a safer practice to put your baby on their back to sleep, um, it doesn't hold down their arm or that moro reflex. So we have to kind of find the balance between safe swaddling, but also uh, recognizing that a baby is going to have the moro reflex, is going to wake and startle and not sleep as well when they're just put to their, most babies, uh, mm -hmm. put to their own devices to be put down like that on their back. Um, and it's just, it, you know, swaddling can be done safely. It's a safe practice. There are ways to do it that's not safe. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's very important to follow those guidelines, just like any baby product that you buy. It's very important to follow what it is that's advised on, you know, when using whatever it is, like whether it be a, a daytime prop and the nap nanny, for example, these types of things that have been taken away and off the market. Most of the time it's because it's not being used per the recommended recommendations. Um, so swaddling, um, to use a swaddle safely means to keep it out of the baby's space, to not overheat a baby, to not use loose swaddles, to use swaddles that fit appropriately per your baby's size, um, to recognize that there's something called TOG on baby swaddles, and you have to follow the TOG per uh, you know, the, your environment, what the weather is outside, um, if your nursery is stable at 68 and 70 to 72 degrees, which is what we should be keeping a baby nursery at, then you can keep your baby in a normal tub for all season wear, um, which is one to 1.5. Um, but if you have, you know, the winter wear uh, on your baby uh, and the temperature is 68 to 72, you run the risk of overheating your baby, which is not any better than letting your baby be cold. So people people have to know what's safe uh, and how to use a swaddle. And most certainly the biggest, you know, hands down, no arguing is when your baby looks like they're getting ready to practice rolling over, um, the, the hands have to be free. Um, so no swaddling of any kind at that point. And that's a huge thing because you don't want your baby rolling onto their tummy and not being able to lift their head and turn their head. Yeah. And, and I'm glad that you brought that up. We actually teach that in our class. And I was very fortunate that my great niece um, was a perfect example. And my niece happened to catch on video for doing the very first little hip push that was showing she was getting ready to start swat, rolling over and she sent it to me. And so that actually is in our, our videos now so that people don't just hear it, but can actually see it. This is what it looks like when a baby's showing you they're going to start rolling soon. Yeah. Uh, and this is when it's time to stop. And that's what the American Academy of Pediatrics tells us about swaddling also is that's when it's time to stop is when the baby starts showing signs that they're going to roll over. Um, can you share with our audience, when do babies usually do that? You know, that's, that's the trick, okay? Because I've seen babies roll over on these video posts, you know, on uh, people showing the baby over and over again, deliberately rolling over as two-year-olds. Um, and that's obviously a very, very unique situation. But 
Uh, babies typically can roll over around eight weeks. They can. So you have to be aware and be very vigilant around that time. But most often it's between four and five months that they do officially like that's a normal developmental milestone. And any, anywhere in between, honestly, like you just really have to know um, when your baby's doing tummy time and floor time and all of that, like do you see the baby doing things that indicate the muscles, they're, you know, halfway turning and falling back. And, you know, those are all signs. Like, okay, well, let's, let's start practicing, you know, the different stages of the, how to unswaddle my baby. Um, and if you want to continue swaddling, it should be supervised. Uh, type of swaddling so it should not be uh with you know you should take definite steps and no matter what swaddle or not you should not have anything inside the baby's crib so if there's that fluke one night where the baby does flip over you know it's a much safer situation if there's nothing in the surface is flat and firm the way it should be um but yes obviously we take all precautions to make sure that's not the case for your baby yeah absolutely so i want to talk to you about it for a minute about the effects of swaddling and kind of what it does, which, you know, we know ultimately it provides a better sleep, but how that can impact sometimes unsafe sleep practices, what that all looks like. And let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, from my time practicing as a pediatric home health nurse, I can tell you that, you know, you walk in and people recognize very quickly, babies are not you know, dumb. They know what they like. They know what feels good. And when people don't know how to swaddle or they don't want to swaddle, if they're left to with a baby that wakes very often and um, they try to find different strategies like using pillows for props um, or homemade hammock style beds or gosh, I've seen it all, like all, si all kinds of things set up in the bedroom because you naturally all of these different positions that people create that are not safe will cause the baby to be feeling a little bit more snug, a little more cozy, um, like in a nice deep seated pillow between mom and dad inside bed, between parents and bed. And, you know, there's big duvet covers right near the baby's face. And there's just all these things that can go wrong um, when you're exhausted. And it's because of the need to get some bit of stretch of sleep. We don't want to sleep. We need sleep. And so it's like you hit a wall, you hit a wall. And that's just when things like falling asleep on the couch and falling asleep, um, you know, uh, while holding your baby in an unsafe position and baby gets between you and the couch and these types of things, baby falling out of your hand when you're too tired. These are the types of things that we worry about when you can't get proper stretches of sleep. And so a swaddle clearly alleviates that because it does give you longer stretches of sleep to so that you sleep when the baby sleeps you know all the things that you're told to do don't worry about the laundry get some sleep when the baby sleeps so all of those things are fine and dandy but not if you can't do it safely and putting the baby <clears throat> at risk by putting the baby in positions that they will sleep better in the middle of between you and your you know your duvet but that's not necessarily the best practice on how to keep a baby safe yeah. So in other words, when baby gets good sleep, parents are more likely to get good sleep and people who are well-rested make better decisions. Correct. Right. Because when we're that exhausted, I mean, science clearly shows us sleep deprivation makes, it impacts our memory. It impacts our decision-making skills. It impacts everything in a negative way. And it can create that environment that is very dangerous and does produce either accidental or just a desperate attempt to get some sleep that could be very, very tragic. And that's heartbreaking. It, is. Um, it absolutely is. And unfortunately, we've all heard the stories. Um, and as a nurse, my guess is you've also encountered the stories. And we don't want to go there. So, ever with a baby. So, does sleep impact babies' development? Does it have anything to do with how they're doing? It, it absolutely does. Um, we can definitely associate high cortisol levels in newborns um, when they are uncomfortable um, and when they have not had proper calming, uh, restful sleep. And so when the, you can imagine when the moral reflex is going off and it's like someone coming out and saying, booty, every single time you're just about to fall asleep. So when babies don't sleep well, 
they don't rest, they have elevated cortisol levels, they tend to have, um, uh, they, when it's been proven as well that swaddling a baby will help babies that are colicky and not feeling well. Um, so it decreases all in all the discomfort that some of the babies have. Um, but uh, developmentally and cognitively speaking, a baby that does not sleep and is not restfully given opportunities to sleep you know, longer stretches will actually suffer in um, ways of not meeting their milestones and not growing as well and losing weight um, even as part of it because when we sleep we burn a lot less calories and when a <laughs> the doctor once told me um don't worry so much all the time about exactly what you're saying or what you're doing or how you're playing with the baby the world is like a Dis disneyland on acid is what he said he said so the amount of information that they take in when they are awake and looking around that needs to be absorbed and babies absorb and process everything and create, you know, create this synap synaptic, sorry, I can't even speak anymore, um, uh, pathways when they are sleeping. And there's a lot of newborn sleep time spent in the REM cycle, the active cycle, and but uh, it's perfectly normal. And that's the newborn world of sleeping 18 hours a day is okay, you know, and that's really good for them. Yeah. For sure. And I think one of the other big things that we sometimes underestimate is the impact on a family. A well-rested baby. Happy family. <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly. And, you know, it, it, it impacts not just the happiness of the family, but it actually can impact mood, postpartum mood disorders as well, can't it? It is written that uh, studies say tenfold that pe uh, parents who have just delivered a baby um, who are not getting enough help and rest uh, can have depression, postpartum depression. It's normal to have a few days um, of blues. You know, our hormones are going crazy right after we have a baby. Um, but when it gets to a point where you, you know, can't function and it's affecting your, you know, your, your partner and your marital status. And, you know, when you're depressed and you're sad, it, we know how it feels to be sleep deprived. You don't feel good and you don't feel good. It, you know, you going through those reactions, you have no filter. You may not be that nice to the people closest to you. So it can cause an overall un unhappiness, a sense of un unhappiness in the, in the home. And so, yes, there's a difference between the type of depression that I'm talking about and sadness uh, where you do need to reach out to your OB, you do need to get onto medications versus you know, trying to alleviate some of the pressures and stress that being sleep deprived uh, can cause just by having some form of um, routine and schedule and fitting in some self-care and trying to get as much sleep as possible can make a huge difference. Absolutely. Well, we are getting close to being out of time, but I would love for you to share with our audience what you've done in this realm. What I, oh, <laughs> so after, what, what did I do? Um, I have uh, created what I hope, what I hope will um, kind of fill in the gap to many of the swaddles that I've worked with for so many years. And it's called the butterfly swaddle. And as much as every uh, baby has their own personality, um, I believe every family has their own likes and dislikes about the idea and concept of swaddling and the type of swaddle that they like. That's the reason for the 500 different kinds of swaddles out there. Um, but this swaddle in particular is very versatile. It allows you to swaddle with arms up, arms down. Um, it allows the baby to actually have movement because the fabric itself stretches. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it, you're, you start with getting the arms down to make a nice snug wrap, so the wrap does not move or ride up. And then it allows the baby to do the, you know, hands to heart, uh, hands over heart uh, positioning. And if you choose, you can loosen the type of swaddle because the swaddle is fully adjustable to allow the baby to have their arms up higher and get their arms out if you do want the baby to have the hands to mouth. And a great thing about this is it's a tool to me to transition your baby through that fourth trimester. So when they're first born, they need a, a lot more wrapping and cuddling. And then you stage through until the baby's actually graduated out of being swaddled all together with one arm in, one, mat, one arm out. That's the way I do it. Everybody's got their own way. Um, and so 
ultimately it's a one in all in one sleep training system. So that, and it's got this really crazy silent Velcro thing. I don't know if you can see it, but it literally feels like cloth and you know, it's silky soft. So you change the diapers and do everything and there's no scaring your baby, no scratching your baby. And it's, it's pretty cool that way. So, and we, we, uh, we have one size out right now, but it's going to be in a larger size in April as well. So for the larger, longer babies, um, we'll have those out soon. Fabulous. I love that. Um, we all always are looking for a way to improve on the products that we use. And Silent Velcro is one of my new favorite things that have come out. Uh, so I think it's fabulous that's there. And I love that it has options uh, because then you can accommodate a lot of different things. So that's fantastic. Um, yeah, you know, for people who don't like to swaddle and just want baby's arms to just be a little bit less uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of that technique of the Moro uh, reflex, they can literally just put it on and it'll at least decrease it. It'll mm -hmm. give them mobility. They're just in the soft, cozy, organic pajama. Mm -hmm. And it's still the actual mesh wings, which are patented on this. That's part of the design. It allows the baby to still have movements, but not be startled all the time. So mm -hmm. that's another thing for people who just don't like slow. <laughs> right. No, I love it. I can't wait to get my hands on one and, and check it out. Um, I know that um, Julie, who works for us, has one um, and has utilized it. So that's a good thing. Um, but I really appreciate that you came on tonight and talked to us, not just about a product, but about swaddling in general and helped provide some really great information for our audience. Um, it has been great to have you on and to learn with you. And I really appreciate it. So thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. It's been so great being on with you. I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity. Absolutely. If you have any questions around this topic or anything to, related to swaddling or the new butterfly swaddle, Put them in the feed and tag Newborn Care Solutions or tag Monica. We'll make sure that you get an answer. And if you're wanting to rewatch this segment or catch any of our past Real Talk episodes, along with accessing our other content, pop on over to newborncaresolutions.com and click on the education tab. And you can also find everything around this on our YouTube channel. Just type Newborn Care Solutions Real Talk into the search engine and it will come up. Thank you for joining us and have a fantastic night. Good night. Thank you.